Well, well, welcome to Lab Life with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Hi, I'm Michelle. And I'm Kenneth. Hello, folks. Today we are speaking with Kristen Sims, a project liaison at AFRL, about her career, powerful mentors, and how having two service dogs, one named Rambo and one named Magnus, has changed her life. In three, two, one. Kristen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so this one's a little different um, than most of our podcasts. Uh, we're under um, some social distancing restrictions right now, so we're all in different parts of the country. But what brought us together was um, the National Puppy Day holiday, <laughs> um, because you are a recent uh, Lab Life feature on our social media handles, you and your dog, uh, Magnus. Could you uh, tell us about Magnus? Um, well, Magnus is a Cane Corso, also known as an Italian Mastiff. Um, I got him from a breeder with the help of my amazing trainer. He is almost five months old, and he weighed 49 pounds this morning. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. <laughs> He'll be about 100 to 130 when he's fully grown, which it won't be for until he's about a year and a half, two years old, where he'll be fully grown. Um, Personality-wise, he's a little bit stubborn as with most Mastiff breeds, um, but he's very smart and he's very self-confident. Um, my trainer says he's a dream, but he has his diva moments and moments <laughs> just kind of sits down and says, I don't want to. <laughs> we'll just, Overall, just wait till he's 130 pounds though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not yet, but hopefully Getting there. kind of work to get that stubbornness in a way that can work for us but honestly he's really a great dog he's a he's a great puppy he's very smart and he picks up things really quickly so he's a he's a good boy yeah and he's training to become a service dog for you right yes yes um i have a trainer that's one of the most educated and experienced trainers in the country um working with me to develop him into a service dog um I connected with my trainer probably back in December and it took about two months to find the right dog to, you know, temperament, all that thing, all those things that kind of need to come together in a perfect storm to make a service dog. Um, but we, we picked him out. He's been training for almost three months now and he actually just got his AKC star puppy title. Yes. Hey, look at that. So yeah, he's doing really good. So you're a project liaison in AFRL's um, rocket propulsion division, and Magnus goes to work with you. Um, could you tell us like how um, how you're training him for that environment, and how he will help you um, as he kind of gets his service dog credentials? Um, well, right now, what he's learning is kind of just basic obedience. Generally, being a good office puppy, um, he he's been coming to work with me pretty much since the day we brought him home. Um, both, uh, both of my supervisors and everything like that, we kind of worked together to make sure that he came in with as little, uh, little difficulty as possible. But he's done really well with kind of just assuming that office puppy role. Um, he's been kind of developing skills that Right now he's actually practicing at home because he knows that you know if I'm on my computer he has to be in his bed and he needs to be quiet and things like that. Um, with, hang on a second, I lost my notes. I'm gonna have to edit this part out. Um, with the project liaison role, there's a lot of moving around, which I enjoy. Um, I'm not I'm not the type that likes being stuck at a desk all day. Um, the nice thing about being, being able to bring Magnus in during this transition, it's kind of allowed me to kind of begin this role with a lot more independence than I had before um, as an intern. I, I relied a lot on my coworkers to kind of help me in those day-to-day -day things. So having Magnus come in from the beginning has given me kind of a way to shift my working abilities, so to speak. Um, so him being there is giving me that that shift in day-to-day -day that I needed to actually function in this different role. Um, currently, for the project liaison role, I'm, I'm learning 
kind of the roles of every branch, including the mission support side, safety, things like that. There are so many wonderful, hardworking, brilliant individuals that are at the lab that work behind the scenes that most people don't even realize that are there. Um, but their contributions to the mission as a whole is so vital that I've kind of been able to develop relationships with and learn about all those inner workings that when you see the rocket test go off, you don't think about, but there's so much more to it than just developing the rocket and testing it. So um, basically to be, to be effective as a project liaison, I've had to really dig into each one of those processes and um, learn every branch really intimately. And it's been so enlightening. I'm really enjoying interacting with all of them and bringing Magnus along. He's got to meet a lot of different people, be in a lot of different environments. Um, he's been to several meetings where he's decided to fall asleep and snore quite loudly. <laughs> which I think some people might occasionally do that too. But <laughs> It's actually been really funny. There's been a few meetings where he's been in the corner and people either don't see him come in or, you know, don't know he's there and then he'll start snoring and people kind of look around, like looking at people, like who's snoring right now? And realizing <laughs> How are they sleeping with their eyes open? Here. So, but you mentioned though uh, in the workplace that Magnus is very good around people. Like he's very, um, I know he's supposed to be closer to you and helping you. When people come and approach you, he is a, a dog who's more respectful of that space or how does he react around a, a lot of people in a uh, smaller office environment? Um, well, we're working on that. When, when I first got him, he barked at every person who walked in the room, which made sense oh, yeah. from when puppies are, are young, they don't see or hear very well. So all you see is this mass of thing coming at you as a puppy. So he was really freaked out at first. So we're working on that. Um, he kind of, because I, I got the breed that we did because they tend to not be, you know, everybody's my best friend. They're like, they tolerate other people, but their family is like awesome. Versus if you look at something like a, a Labrador, they tend to be everybody's my best friend. So he's, he's getting better about it, but for the most part, he just kind of ignores people around me at this point. So, which is a good thing. It's good for service work because he's very much focused on me. So. Yeah, that's amazing. You can keep that focus. And that's, I'm assuming you said part of his training, but having the specific breed as well, because you're his family, that, that kind of plays into both aspects there. Yes. Um, a lot of times when you have labs or specifically with my first dog, service dog Rambo, um, they tend to getting them to focus on one person or not really enjoying attention from strangers is something that you kind of have to train out of them versus with Magnus. He's like, if somebody tries to pet him and he doesn't know them, he'll move his head. <laughs> hey, good on him. I don't want you to touch me, but he doesn't <laughs> doing it in the angry way. He's just like, who are you? straight so and uh with that too i don't think we asked beforehand but what inspired you to name him magnus oh gosh there was a list of 200 names that i was going oh, wow with. um i i couldn't have something that rhymed with rambo because rambo is 10 years old he's i don't know if i, I intro rambo rambo is a 10 year old chihuahua mix um i got him the day off i got off active duty in 2010 he's my first service dog He's very smart and he's great with people, but he's going a little bit deaf. So if anything sounds like his name, he will come to you. So I had to make sure that when I named Magnus, his name did not rhyme with Rambo. Um, that makes sense. I, I went through a lot of names. Part of it too was after I met him, that kind of changed because he's a really chill dog and I couldn't name him something like chaos because it just didn't fit. Um, but I kind of went through and I wanted something that was fairly strong sounding that I could yell out my back window at two in the morning and not have my neighbors be confused. Um, so there was, there was a big long process, but his, his name, his middle name is Tiberius. So when he gets in trouble, he is Magnus Tiberius, but yeah, I needed something a little bit stronger and macho sounding cause he's, he's such a stoic and, proud and confident little dog. So I needed something that was kind of reflective on that. No, that makes sense. And uh, did you say before that you're a Star Trek fan? 
Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> so that also fantastic middle name. Yes, yes. That was, we kind of went back and forth. My, my husband would not allow me to name him Worf. That would have been amazing. Right? I thought <laughs> about it a lot. <laughs> I mean, trust me, we have a new dog ourselves, and I was really pushing to make his name Jordy, but uh, my family wouldn't have it, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, we, have a, we have a pit bull mix named Freya, so the, the, another thought was maybe doing a Viking theme, naming him Odin, but then I didn't want to leave Rambo out to be like <laughs> a Viking named, with, without a Viking well, themed name, so. It's still, it's powerful to make sense. That's great. So uh, that, um, especially from what you mentioned beforehand, it sounds like he'll really grow into Magnus. He already is. So. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a very, very self-confident dog. And he kind of has this, this look most of the time of he's, he's just very confident in himself, which is great when he interacts with new things. He's just kind of, it takes him a minute and then he's like, oh, okay, we're going to go with it. So. Honestly, I wish I could be like that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, really he cool. did. He does better with a lot of things than I do sometimes. Like his first sonic boom out at the lab, he just kind of looked up and barked for a second. And then I was like, oh, okay, whatever. And then everyone after that, he's just like, meh. Okay, that's fine. Still great for him, though. The fact he can adapt that quickly, especially oh, hearing, yeah. like you mentioned, even being a puppy earlier, how startling that could be. I mean, he's yeah. learning quick. Yeah, he is. He's, he's really smart. And I've, even the things that I've taught him to do, just, you know, stupid dog tricks almost he'll pick it up almost instantly but that stubbornness will sometimes come in and after a while he'll get bored and be like no i'm done <laughs> i'm just gonna lay down so so with that training then um so you you mentioned you've had a very good trainer who's been helping you with magnus and um before him with rambo um did you have a trainer with him um i i went through a trainer at PetSmart for rambo um so most of the training was training i did myself um but with Magnus, we had dis we started discussing uh, kind of allowing Rambo to officially retire back in December. Um, one of those things that kind of brought it on was moving into this new role as project liaison. I knew that I could not rely on um, my office mate, Selena, or Dr. Phillips to kind of help me with those day-to-day -day things because I would be moving offices and I wanted to be a little bit more independent. So I found uh, John Anthony and Redemption Road Canine back in December. And I, when I first called them, I think I spent 30 minutes on the phone with them. And it was just a very natural connection that I had with him. And he was able to kind of, I, I gave him a general idea of the things I needed. And I told him the struggles that I had with training Rambo myself. And so it kind of naturally progressed to the point where it's like, okay, these are the things that maybe we should improve upon on the next dog and things that, you know, Rambo does that are really great. So months and months and months later, now when I got Magnus, everything kind of fell into place really easily. So having, having the trainer there from day one, he actually went with me to the breeder to pick Magnus out like a month before we ended up bringing him home. And I mean, he's, he's gone with me to vet appointments when I thought his leg, Magnus's leg looked weird at a specific angle. And he got up at six in the morning on a Saturday to come to the vet with me for that. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's, yeah, that's great. So does Magnus see him as part of the family as well? Yes. He is, he is uncle John. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he does have kind of a different, you know, there, there are levels of people. There's me and my husband who are super awesome. And then there's, you know, Uncle John and a handful of other people that are, that are cool, but they're, they're not the inner circle of trust. But yeah, he does. He loves his trainer. He, he really enjoys going there and he completely passes out as, as soon as we get in the car once we're done. But yeah. He, hey, that can help too. Yeah. <laughs> He, he responds really well to the trainer and the trainer's really like he adapts to what Magnus's behavior is developing into and things like that. So he's, he's really great. The whole team down at uh, Redemption Road has been a godsend since day one. So Kristen, earlier you mentioned, you mentioned Rambo that you got um, the day after you left active duty. Could you tell us about your, 
your journey in the Department of Defense from, you know, being active duty, I, I believe, Army to, you know, present day? How did you, how did you stumble upon the Air Force Research Laboratory? Uh, yeah, well, I started, I started in the Army. I enlisted uh, in the reserves at 18. Um, I deployed to Iraq and then I stayed on active duty after I got back from Iraq. Um, I, I got Rambo the day I got released from active duty. He was a puppy mill rescue. And then I went back to school and I struggled a lot when I first went back to school after, after getting off of active duty. Um, I dropped out of school the first time and then I went to work for the sheriff's office actually as a corrections deputy for a while. And then I went back to school. We had fully trained Rambo at that point and he was my service dog all through um, the completion of my BBA in management. And then we moved out to California and Dr. Daryl Marchant, who's now working at the Pentagon, he, uh, he was working as the deputy division chief at the time at the lab. He hired me without an interview, which I don't know if he knew what he was getting himself into. <laughs> uh, he hired me as a management assistant back in 2017 and I've been at the lab ever since. That's awesome. And like, so Rambo or now Magnus, they can help you in, in crowds or times of social anxiety or loud noises like the sonic booms and things like that. Is that kind of their role of helping you be more independent, whether it was getting through your schooling or, you know, getting around um, Edwards Air Force Base? Uh, yeah, the crowds in a classroom were something I really struggled with, which is why I failed miserably the first time. I actually went from um, having a 1.6 GPA to a 3.9 after I started bringing Rambo to class with me. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Even just sitting in a room with 30 people for an hour was really, really hard for me. So having Rambo there was absolutely pivotal for me to complete my degree. It took me six years to get my associates. So just, just to, because I had to take almost every class over again. Um, yeah, just things like being in a room with people with Magnus, I'm able to go to promotion ceremonies, you know, all calls, things like that. And those are things I, I cannot do by myself. Um, sonic booms, probably about 30% of the time, I'll kind of not be able to refocus after them. It kind of, it creates a response in me that I'm not able to recover from very well. Uh, before I had Magnus, my coworkers were, would be like, okay, just, you're, you're breathing weird. Come on, let's go, let's go outside type of thing. But um, having Magnus there and Rambo before him, he, they, they've both been able to kind of respond to that, that change in cortisol levels and things along those lines. And with, with Magnus more than Rambo, um, he'll be able to help me with my balance when he gets older, which will be really great. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's tremendous um, how they've been able to unlock, you know, you contribute even more to our mission, you know, just with their presence. That's awesome. Absolutely. And I, I didn't want to have to, I mean, I, I relied on, on my coworkers from, for the day to day when, when Rambo wasn't coming with me. Cause like I said, he's, he's 10 years old now. He's slowing down. I thought it was, you know, we needed to retire him. And even when he did come to work with me, it was kind of like, I could tell that he was getting tired, um, but being able to be less reliant on the people around me at work when things like that happened is, is really nice. And they, I've never felt like they were bothered by it or burdened by it, but just being able to have that independence of being able to do everything myself <laughs> is nice. Yeah, I, I think it's helped. It was helpful for me the first time I talked to you and maybe some of our listeners, you know, you know, get in general what, you know, service dogs can do. Like when you think of a more, you know, visible disability, if people have mobility issues or, or, you know, a blindness or something like that, like you get it, but you don't get it when it's these seeming, you know, I don't know if trigger is the right word, but these environments that aren't healthy for you that you have a response to, it's, it really helped me to have you under explain that to me, how, how the dogs are helping you you kind of yeah. like an invisible disability or, you know, something like that. So. Um, absolutely. I mean, appearances are, are so deceiving. There, there are people, like you said, with very visible disabilities um, and others that are not so obvious. 
um, there, you know, disabilities are not always visible. And I'm hoping that that becomes more, you know, there's more awareness comes to that um, in the future. And like with Magnus being a, a Cane Corso, not every person with a service dog is going to have a lab or a German Shepherd. I've met Great Danes, Pit Bulls, Chihuahuas that are very capable service animals. And you know, with Magnus, we chose a breed that fit my needs and our lifestyle. And just because he's not the typical service dog and I'm not somebody who's extremely obviously physically disabled, there, there tends to be a little bit of confusion with some people. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, more and more people are going to be aware that you're not always going to have somebody wearing sunglasses and a, you know, lab as they're seeing eye dog. That's, that's not what all service dogs do. They have so many other different facets of, you know, service work that they can do. And dogs are brilliant. They can learn so much. They can be so helpful to so many people. Even I have friends that have, you know, debilitating rheumatoid arthritis that they'll have a flare up one day and they won't be able to actually pull themselves out of bed. And then the next day they're walking fine. There are just things like that, that you won't immediately see sometimes, but they're very real and they're very there. And sometimes, you know, you need that dog that the dog is necessary on one day and not on another. But in my case, like when I, before I started working with Rambo, I was on six different medications. And after kind of integrating Rambo into that process and using him as a service dog, now the only medication I take is for arthritis. That's, That's amazing. Great. Yeah. So it's, it's been really nice to kind of be, free from all those meds and still have something that allows me to function for the most part normal. Yeah. And, and doing good things um, for, you know, the department of defense, again, being back on the team at AFRL. Um, so you, you mentioned that you came in originally as a, uh, a management assistant in you then pursued your master's degree and I think you were engaged in our pathways program. Yes. Um, I would not have gotten my master's degree if it hadn't been for the pathways program. Um, actually with the labs tuition reimbursement and my GI bill, I paid almost nothing out of pocket for all of my higher education. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah. And with, I, I wouldn't have even gone for that if it hadn't been for, you know, the pathways tuition assistance and for the people that I worked with, I mean, just the, the constant push to live up to my potential was something that everyone was pretty much on me from the, from day one, because at the time, like just getting my associates was a real struggle. And then with my bachelor's, it became a little bit easier once me and Rainbow kind of found a rhythm, but I never in a million years dreamed that I would actually go for a master's until I came to the lab. And you That's mentioned fantastic. beforehand the, a few of the big names that came up, but what are some of the mentors or who were they that helped really drive you to this point? Uh, well, Dr. Daryl Marchant, he's the one who hired me. He's the former RQR deputy division chief. He works at the Pentagon now with, uh, with the AFRL still, but um, he hired me and he had faith in me from day one at the lab, which I'm sure was, I, I wouldn't have, but he did. Um, I wouldn't have my master's degree if he hadn't been so encouraging and fiercely supportive of everything that I wanted to do. Um, he's still a great resource for me. He's been a great mentor. Uh, Dr. Sean Phillips, he's the current RQR division chief. He's been an absolute champion of mine since like day one at AFRL. He has fought for me every step of the way. And his continuing support has been really crucial to the transition to, um, from a pathways intern to a permanent party project liaison. Um, he sets the bar really high for me and he, he has really high expectations. And having that challenge given to me is, I really enjoy. Um, 
Colonel Ann Clark, she's now retired. She was the de the former Debt 7 commander out at the lab. Uh, she would sit with me for hours to try to help me figure out what I wanted to do at the lab or outside the lab. Um, she taught me to kind of recognize my strengths and simple interactions like meetings and um, interviews are, are kind of difficult for me. And she would prepare with me a lot for those. Um, and the last one, Julie Carlisle, she's the current deputy division chief at RQR. She's been so helpful with resources for me and Magnus. Uh, she pushed me out of my comfort zone and like, like Dr. Phillips and uh, Dr. Marchant, she's kind of set the bar really high and kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone. I was talking to her the other day and we were talking about this, this new role that I'm moving into and she goes, okay, well, what about after that? She, they, all, all four of them really kind of pushed me to look beyond what I'm doing now or what I'm going to do to kind of see where, what the five-year plan is, so to speak. So having, having all of them in my corner has been just so tremendous. I, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today without all of them. And even with just the addition of Magnus, they've made that process so seamless to, you know, he's, he's a fixture now at the lab and they've, they've been all so fiercely supportive of both of us since day one. Yeah, it's amazing to have that many people, not only in your court, but helping drive you further in your career. Because a lot of people don't think about looking at five years ahead. Once they hit that point, they're like, I made it to this position. I'll be happy here for a while. But the fact they're saying, hey, but over that hill, we got more to go on. That's inspirational for anyone. That's great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, when when Dr. Marchant was still at the lab, it would be like every week, okay, what, what next? What next? You know, so I've, and even my coworkers have just been great, like, with Magnus, it's kind of difficult to do anything alone. Like if I wanted to get up and go get a drink from the fridge next to my office, you know, that requires waking up the dog, going down the hallway, things like that. So even somebody being like, you know what, I will go to the fridge for you <laughs> and get you your drink and bring it back to you. It's just silly things like that that you don't think about. And just the, the helpfulness of everybody around me, my coworkers and my mentors alike, they've just been all great. I've never, I've never felt weird or unwelcome at the lab or that anything that I've struggled with has been a burden to them, which is great. Oh, absolutely. To ha again, to have even like um, outside of leadership, to have that support from coworkers, I mean, that's indispensable. That's very, very powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. And I know you mentioned it beforehand with your new position. Um, some of the leadership you mentioned here, um, the people you helped form that new position you're currently going into, this project liaison? Yes. Um, I, I sat down with uh, Dr. Phillips, Julie Carlisle, and um, Colonel Mike Dooley. And they said, we need this role to kind of facilitate better communication, kind of be Switzerland, if you would, um, for all of these projects and really kind of facilitate that communication. And so I sat down with them and I said, okay, this is what we want. Okay, well, this person could also do, you know, this particular thing in addition to that. I sat down with them. They were all giving me what they needed and I just kind of added just a little bit. They were most of it because they are the professionals. I just, from the from the organizational leadership and behavior standpoint, I kind of was like, well, we can add this, but I think this would be too much type of thing. But having that, being in that role after, you know, they said we had a need for it, you know, months ago, and then seeing it come to you know, completion and moving into that role, I'm really excited to see where I can move it from there and make it better and more efficient, things like that. Absolutely. And you mentioned this role, the major part that you kind of crafted is you're going between a lot of these project leads and making sure that everyone's either understanding what's happening or at least getting what information they might need. Yes. Um, so lots of communication, lots of moving around. Um, like I said before, I'm, I'm not big on sitting at a desk all day. It makes me a little crazy. So being able to kind of move around and see all these things that you don't realize are part of the fabric of the lab when you just see the external 
okay, we, we test, we develop and test rockets, you know, the, there's so much more to it and seeing all these people that work behind the scenes and really, I mean, the support side of it is so much more than what I realized. And even I, I spent a couple of weeks with, uh, with our safety, all of you guys work so much harder than I realized, you know, they work so hard, they do so much and being able to see that all from kind of a different perspective was really enlightening. And I think it'll really help me when I get, really moving in this position and being able to make sure that everybody has what they need. Yeah, there's a lot more to the lab than rocket science, even though that's a huge part of, especially in your area, but there's a lot of support functions that make things happen, happen well. Yes, yes, a lot more than what we see. Because when I first got hired out there, I said, I have no future here. These are rocket scientists and I am not a rocket scientist. I have a degree in business, but the, the longer I've spent here, the more I've realized that there's a lot of things that are needed besides scientists and engineers, so. Yeah, we really appreciate you sharing your really, a really personal journey with us so other people can understand, um, you know, how they can thrive in different opportunities. Do you have any kind of parting advice for people that are going through some like a similar life challenge or, you know, even just, you know, going back to school while working any number of, of things that you've faced and have um, triumphed, you know, from. Um, well, schedule and balance were some were things that it took me a little while to learn when I first got to the lab and I started my, my degree full time along with working full time. Um, you need to set aside time every day for homework, but you also have to schedule gym time and Netflix time. Um, <laughs> you, your brain and body kind of work in tandem. If you don't give yourself some physical exercise and also time to relax, you need to have that, that balance. Your body and your brain need to work in tandem if you want longevity and recognizing your limits and making sure you don't burn out because doing your best does not mean working yourself into a breakdown. Um, for me, the really difficult part was not reaching out for help when I was really struggling. Like I said, I flunked out of community college the first time I tried. Um, recognizing that you don't have to fight it alone. Um, I am an independent person. I want to do everything myself, but recognizing that that was burning me out was a very difficult conversation I had with myself. Um, thankfully, at the lab, especially, I have a really great group of so many people that have been assisting me and looking out for me and pushing me beyond my comfort zone. Um, accepting that help when it's given and not fighting it and not seeing accepting that help as weakness. Um, for um, more of the medical side of it, be willing to look at the alternative treatments when things aren't working. I was, like I said before, I was on six different medications before I started working with Rambo um, as my service dog. And now I take one and it's for arthritis. <laughs> But the same solution isn't going to work for everyone. And learning to kind of adapt and push until you find something that works specifically for you. That took five or six years for me. And I had a, you know, I have a great family, I have a great husband. They're, they were the ones that kind of pushed me to find something that worked for me. But it doesn't have to take five to six years if you recognize that one solution for one person isn't going to always work for you. So finding the thing that best allows you to be healthy and function is going to take a little time, but being patient with yourself and being patient with the process is important and necessary. Well, thank you. It's definitely a positive message of resiliency and persistence. Um, Really appreciate you joining us for the podcast, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Make sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube at AF Research Lab. 
And remember, stay curious. Logging off.